and I thought the methods we'd used in the oceans would actually work on the continents. And so I did a land grab, right? I thought, you know, what part of the continents is likely to be the easiest to work in? And I knew from the oceanic work that what we needed to do was to look at what's happening now and look at it on a very large scale. So I grabbed the bit of land from the Azores to eastern Iran. And I thought that was big enough. It wasn't quite. I should have gone to eastern Afghanistan. But that didn't really matter. And started to look at the, the, the motion on the faults throughout the whole of that region to try and understand what was happening. Because I thought that the oceanic story was finished. So basically what I found out was that Turkey is moving very rapidly westwards. Not northwards like Africa, but westwards. And the Aegean is actually, relative to Europe, moving to the southwest and is stretching the whole of the Aegean now. And this was a real surprise because we were expecting, since Africa was moving northwards, that actually the story would be of shortening throughout the whole of the Alpine Himalayan belt. But it isn't at all like that. You get all these fragments which whiz around in what was originally rather unpredictable. We didn't understand why they would move in the way that they did. Uh, I think we now do. Uh, but at the beginning, this was v v really quite striking. And it made sense of, of why the whole story had come from working in the oceans and not the continents, because the continental deformation is not nearly as straightforward as the oceans. I arrived in this department to do my PhD in 1976, which was an interesting time. The first thing we did was we went to Iran. Uh, the reason why that was a good time to be here is that all sorts of new, new things were happening. It was just after the satellite images were widely available from space, which really allowed you to look at places the size of Iran and see things which you couldn't possibly see on the ground. They were just too big. Faults which were hundreds of kilometres long. You could see the whole structure of the country for the first time. And this was a big advance which happened in the early 70s. We're still there and we're still working with some of the people we worked with 30 years ago. And we have a very good relationship with them. They're good geologists who've seen a lot of things. And we've sort of grown up together as the tricks have, have progressed and got more sophisticated. Uh, we're able to do more together. But the, the main thing is that we... we we use both the field observations, actually going into the field after earthquakes to see how the, what happened to the ground, what moved, uh, and combine it with a whole load of tricks which have developed in the 30 years since that time, like GPS and radar and all the seismological tricks which have developed are, are really much more sophisticated than they were. So we can see in extreme detail what actually happens in these earthquakes and how they make the landscape. Because the real trick is learning how to read the signals in the landscape that tell you what are, what's going on. If you know what happens in an earthquake, where the ground just moves two or three metres, even in big earthquakes, and you can see exactly what happened, you can do a thought experiment. You can stand there and think to yourself, OK, supposing there were 100 or 1,000 of earthquakes in the same place, you can see why that mountain's there. You can see why the landscape looks like it does. And that's how you learn to read the signals in the landscape, which tell you that there are earthquakes there. So that's a very tangible benefit. You pass on to the local people. They can train engineers and town planners and so on to recognise those kind of signals. So it was a good time to actually really focus on these problems of the continents, which were, at that time, the big problem. People knew what was going on in the oceans, and the continents, they knew they didn't understand what was happening there. What you see is the country of Iran, which is about a 1,000 kilometres across. To the southwest here, you have Arabia, which is flat, and it's flat because it's doing nothing. Out here, you have Central Asia, Turkmenistan, which is also flat because it's doing nothing. And the reason the mountains are there in Iran is because the earthquakes have pushed them up. And so that is the basic story. So what you have is a very wide zone between these stable areas in the south, uh, Saudi Arabia, and in the north up here, Central Asia. And the whole of Iran, a thousand kilometers across, is smashed up by lots and lots of faults with lots and lots of earthquakes. And it doesn't mean anything to say where is the plate boundary. Tehran, which is here, is not on a plate boundary. It's within a great smashed up pile of rubble separating two stable areas. And that is the basic problem of looking at the continents. You can't say what plate is Athens on, what plate is Lassa on in Tibet. They're not on plates. They're in these big, wide, damaged areas.